Thank you so much. And um, yeah, to reintroduce myself, I'm Oliver. I recently graduated from Yale Divinity School with a Master's in Divinity. I'm currently in the uh, discernment process for ordination in the United Church of Christ. And I'm so grateful to be here. Um, Thomas Merton was a huge inspiration for me to study religion and spirituality and um, was part of my journey in applying to Divinity School. Was grateful to be able to do an independent study on Thomas Merton last fall. Um, and I just re really appreciate the way that he integrates contemplative spirituality with uh, social conscience in the world. Um, I Another great thing about Thomas Merton is all the amazing people he was in relationship with, all the friendships he had in his life. And I see his legacy living on in each generation of spiritual seekers who encounter his influence through his writings. Um, French friends and students, and so um, to be here among uh, all these wonderful people is, is such a blessing. So, thanks again for uh, having me as a Dabby scholar. Very grateful. Thank you, Oliver. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Koblenz. I'm a faculty member here at uh, St. Mary's College. So, let me add my word of welcome to all of you. We're so delighted to have you here on campus. It's my privilege to introduce our plenary speaker for this session, Maria Clara Lucchetti Bingamer. Maria Clara Lucchetti Bingamer holds a degree in social communication from the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, a master's degree in theology from the same university, and a PhD in systematic theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University. She is currently a full professor in the Department of Theology at PUC Rio. For 10 years, she ran the Loyal of Faith and Culture Center at the same university. For four years, she was an evaluator of graduate programs as a coordinator for the improvement of higher education personnel. And for six years, she was dean of the Center for Theology and Human Sciences at PUC Rio. She has experience in the area of theology with an emphasis on systematic theology, focusing on the themes of God, otherness, women, violence, and spirituality. In the last few years, she has been researching and publishing on the thought of the French philosopher Simone Weil. Nowadays, her study and research are primarily directed towards the, uh, the thinking and writing of contemporary mystics and the interfa uh, interface between theology and literature. As David mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Bingamer is joining us virtually today uh, from Brazil, so you'll have to be extra loud as you join me in welcoming her so that she can hear us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's a joy to be here. I'm very honored by this invitation, and I'm sorry not being able to be there with you. I was planning to, but I couldn't. So I hope the technology will help us and you can hear me properly when I am speaking about this subject, the feminine in Merton's life. Some notes on his experience with women. I begin with two quotes. The first from Julio Garcia Caparros in the prologue of the excellent book of Ines of Cristina Imogen's Sons, the fem uh, La Sinfonia Femenina and Thomas Merton. Interesting men and women are usually those who have lived several lives in one. Much more attractive than having a history is a past, as suggested by that conjurer of charms, Oscar Wilde. Of course, Tom Merton, Thomas, Ludovicus, Father Louis, traverses those lives in a not too long period, because 53 years is not too many years, not for a kind of bitnik, poet, young man of prejudicial behavior, for a Catholic convert, a Trappist monk, a political activist, a spiritual guide, an American Lama, and for a lover, not always the best, of the feminine. This for the first quote. The second is from Merton's most, most famous no, novice, Ernesto Cardenal. Instead of talking to me, 
about the spiritual life, he would talk to me about anything. And he never told me that this was teaching me the spiritual life. <clears throat> As it turned out, he taught me to be like him, in whom the spiritual life was not separate from any other human interest. So the Trappist monk, Thomas Merton, is undoubtedly a mystic. That means someone who experienced in his lifetime a loving intimacy with the mystery of God, secret of life. And this experience was partly configured by his relationship with women. Merton lived the Vatican II and the first years after it. In his lifetime, feminism hadn't entered the church. Once the book Beyond God the Father, written by Mary Daly, was published only in 1974. Thomas Merton then lived in a church where women were still discriminated and even considered by many people subordinated in the order of creation, responsible by the entrance of sin in the world. In these circumstances, Merton thought, wrote, and prayed in feminine and elaborated favorable thoughts towards women. He was very close to many women and was inspired by the feminine to write his poems, essays, and prayers. His poem, As Sophia, is a witness of that. Here, we'll try to raise and highlight some yeah. notes on the feminine relationships, uh, relationships of the famous monk and writer. This itinerary begins with a loss, his mother's premature death, his mother's premature loss, which opened a deep void in the six-year-old boy heart. In Merton, the openness to the beauty of the world and to the creatures in every dimension they could present and are present in every page of his numerous writings, should they be poems, essays, or prayers. One can feel at every step of the reading of his pages, the presence of a surprise which makes him dream, react, smile, or cry, in any sense to feel deeply. That is the case with his relationship with women. Uh, but this relationship with the feminine so positive in his life starts with the sad and painful loss, the death of his mother. Speaking about her in his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, he says, and I quote, I inherited from my mother some of her dissatisfaction with the mass the world is in, and some of her versatility, end of quote. Merton didn't have many joyful memories of his deceased mother. On the contrary, he describes her as, I quote, worried, precise, quick, critical of me, her son, end of quote. The tense personality of his mother was due, according to the son's diagnosis, to an obsession with perfection. Ruth Merton was a perfectionist in everything. I quote, a person full of insatiable dreams and of great ambition after perfection. Perfection in art, in interior decoration, in dancing, in housekeeping, in raising children. And he adds with some bitterness that himself, her first son was for her quite a deception. Merton's mother gets sick of cancer and dies when he was only six years old. He describes this deep and tremendous loss for any child with some sober and apparently cold words. I quote, her sickness probably accounts for my memory of her as thin and pale and rather severe. End of this quote but not without having said before, another quote, I was never even taken to the hospital to see mother after she went there, end of quote. And he finishes his account on that first yeah. feminine figure in his life, as it, it's in any human life, with a statement like, I quote, I did not miss mother very much and did not weep when I was not allowed to go and see her. End of quote. Nevertheless, there is an explicit mention to the receipt of a note handwritten by Ruth before dying, which provoked in little Tom a turmoil of feelings. He narrates, then one day father gave me a note to read 
I was very surprised. It was for me personally, and it was in my mother's handwriting. I don't think she had ever written to me before. There had never been any occasion for it. Then I understood what was happening, although, as I remember, the language of the letter was confusing to me. Nevertheless, one thing was quite evident. My mother was informing me by mail that she was about to die and would never see me again. The tremendous weight of sadness and depression felt by that child after reading many times that note until reaching some comprehension on what was going on was not a childish sorrow with tears and sobs, uh, questions, searching for consoling, but the heavy perplexity and gloom of an adult grief. The absence of faith and religious feelings and practice added to this depth of sorrow and nonsense of that loss. Thomas Merton didn't pray for his mother because he was never taught to do so. As he declares, I quote, it was not until I became Catholic 20 years later that it finally occurred to me to pray for my mother, end of quote. Not having been allowed to see his dead mother, Tom limited his grief to see his father and his grandmother weeping and crying. Pain was now dominating the house where Ruth Merton's feminine and maternal presence was previously alive. And the description of the post-mortem rituals is quite impressive as they also contain a memory of that lost mother into the son's heart and mind. I quote, mother for some reason had always wanted to be cremated. I suppose that fits in with the whole structure of her philosophy of life. That that body was simply something to be put out of the way as quickly as possible. I remember how she was in the house at flushing with the rag tied tightly around her head to keep the dust out of her hair, cleaning and sweeping and dusting the rooms with the greatest energy and intensity of purpose. And it helps one to understand her impatience with useless and decaying flesh. That was something to be done away with, without delay. When life was finished, let the whole thing be finished forever. Tom will be haunted by the rest of his life by the void left by his mother's death. Somehow, it is the mother that others draw for him that he ends up meeting. His mother he himself will never know. The child Tom will lose everything about his mother, even the name she gave him, at a given moment entering the Trappist Abbey. He may love her, yes, of course, but he will have the memories of his mother that others will have created for him, not the ones that he could create with her. In the journals, nevertheless, we can find a poetic test dedicated to Ruth Merton. I see a tangle of dark wild roses and light colored roses. My attention is fixed on a beautiful pink rose that becomes luminous. Yeah. And I notice the silky texture of its petals. My mother's face appears behind the roses, which are fading away." End of quote. According to Cristina Imoges Sanz in her book, La Sinfonia Femenina de Thomas Merton, that lost feminine archetype of his late mother was found, refound, in the abbey he will live afterwards, where he will live afterwards, including the presence of Mary as an idealized woman, monastic mm -hmm. life, and the deep experience of God helped him to balance the tensions in his life, develop his mat mature identity, and replace the feminine in his life. The Abbey helped Merton to deal with his complete loneliness before learning the mortal disease that would kill his father. As he say, and I quote, after receiving the news about the disease of his father, I sat there in the dark, unhappy room, unable to think, unable to move, with all the innumerable elements of my isolation crowding in upon me from every side, without a home, without a family, without a country, without a father, apparently without any friends, without any interior peace or confidence or light or understanding of my own, without God too, without God, without heaven, without grace, without anything. 
During his adult life before the conversion, Melton, Merton felt deeply and painfully this bite of loneliness. After his father's death, he thought having finally reached the freedom he so deeply longed for. As it is said, for instance, when he started his adult life after his second great loss in his life, I quote, the death of my father left me sad and depressed for a couple of months, but that eventually wore away. And when it did, I found myself completely striped of everything that impeded the movement of my own will to do as it pleased. I imagined that I was free and it would take me five or six years to discover what a frightful captivity I had got myself into." End of quote. <laughs> Merton moved a lot during that period, traveling to many places, but not getting rid of this loneliness and void feeling. Like when he was entering Rome in a trip, his joyful and marveled, and he writes, so there I was with all the liberty that I had promising myself so, for so long. The world was mine. How did I like it? I was doing just what I pleased. And instead of being filled with happiness and well-being, I was miserable. The love of pleasure is destined by its very nature to defeat itself and end in frustration. End of quote. In this itinerary of search for freedom and fullness and frustrations and loneliness, Merton's life was agitated by many presences, many of them feminine. He even had a child whom he never met. During this period, he never saw women as equals or as somebody. He saw them as something. He sadly recognizes this later, mentioning the so many girls he seduced and used and whose names he didn't even remember. At some point in his life, women were nothing more than objects of desire and pleasure, whom he sought and used without the slightest respect or consideration. Later, he's going to recognize that as a failure in his capacity of relating to others. And I quote, with my failure to really trust another person enough to give myself completely to her. My sexual adventures were always seductions. I wished them to be conquests in which I gave nothing. I was merely taking. I think that both my need and probably my latent capacity to give from myself were once very deep." End of quote. Later on, reflecting on his life, Merton reaches a conscience of the evil of patriarchalism and gender oppression when he writes, Man is more human and proves his humanity, I do not say his virility, in the quality of his relationship with women. This obsession with virility and conquest makes a true and deep relationship impossible. Men today believe that there is no difference between their capacity for conquest and their capacity for love. They completely forget the need for love, a desperate need, not the need to receive everything, but the need to give love. Also, he begins to be more and more conscious of the roots of patriarchalism and women discrimination. This awareness makes him, more at the end of his life, very critic for his own country and culture. As he says, preaching a retreat to a group of contemplative nuns, I quote, men are jealous of women. I think the problem with the American male today is that he is afraid of women. He needs to treat them with brutality, to show them that he's the master. In addition, advertising promotes the image of the macho, the male." End of quote. Merton's process of conversion to Catholicism drew him to take distance from his previous life and enter in a new dynamism. And here, he starts to meet and establish relationships with other feminine figures who, symbolic or concrete, alives in history or alives in God, had great influence in his new Christian and spiritual life. He started to discover with consolation and devotion the lives of saints. Among those, there were many female saints, women who inspired him, accompanied him, helped him in his spiritual struggles and in his vocation. I will mention here only some one of them. There are many. I will mention first, St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, 
One of the first women with whom Merton made an effective and spiritual friendship was St. Therese of Lisieux. She was, like he said, his friend in heaven. At first, he was very critical about her with the appearance her images had, the taste a little bit kitsch that surrounded the way she was presented by the church for the faithful devotion. His lucid and modern spirit resisted a lot to all that, I quote, appearance of a saint in the midst of all the stuffy, over plush, over decorated, comfortable ugliness and mediocrity of the bourgeoisie. Teresa of the Child Jesus was a Carmelite, that's true. But what she took into the convent with her was a nature that had been formed and adapted to the background and mentality of the French middle class of the late 19th century, then which nothing could be imagined more complacent and apparently immovable. The one thing that seemed to me more or less impossible was for Grace to penetrate the thick, resilient hide of bourgeois smugness and really take hold of the immortal soul beneath that surface in order to make something out of it. At best, I thought, such people might turn out to be harmless prigs, but great sanctity, never, end of quote. Everything in the little flower's life and spirituality gave him repugnance. The poems she wrote, the art she loved, the house and ambience Le Buissonnet, where she was raised and brought up. Nevertheless, after reading a good book on her, written by Henri Guéon, he suddenly overcame this repulse and got closer and closer to that little French saint who seemed so lacking of personality. He says, no sooner had I got a faint glimpse, glimpse of the real character and the real spirituality of St. Therese, than I was immediately and strongly attracted to her. An attraction that was the, word, uh, the work of grace, since, as I say, it took me in one jump clean through a thousand psychological obstacles and repugnancies. And here is what strikes me as the most phenomenal thing about her. She became a saint not by running away from the middle class, not by abjuring and despising and cursing the middle class or the environment in which she had grown up. On the contrary, she clung to it in so far as one could cling to such a thing and be a Carmelite, a good Carmelite, end of quote. This capacity of synthesis with things apparently so incompatible seduced Merton, who felt attracted and in love with Therese of Lisieux. Not only he began to communicate with her in prayer, as he also started to trust to her some important concerns of his heart, like the future of his brother, who was far away. Finally, she was of decisive importance when he was beginning to lose hope about his desire to enter the Trappist. To the point he approaches her shrine in the dark and tells her these uh, humble, a little desperate and so affectionate words, I quote. It was very, very dark by the shrine of the little flower. For heaven's sake, help me, I said. Please help me. What am I going to do? I can't go on with like this. You can see that. Look at the state I am in. What was I to do? Show me the way. As if I needed more information of some kind of a sign. But I said this time to the little flower, you show me what to do. And I added, if I get to the monastery, I will be your monk. Now show me what to do, end of quote. At the occasion of his entrance into the novitiate of the Trappist, Merton narrates with simple and moving words the presence of this woman who was a faithful friend to him at that crucial moment of his life. I quote, Father Master showed us where the novitiate chapel was, and we knelt a moment before the Blessed Sacrament in that plain whitewashed room. I noticed a statue of my friend St. Joan of Arc on one side of the door, and on the, on the other was, of course, the little flower." End of quote. The second spiritual friend and guide of Merton, Merton was Julian of Norwich, called by him Lady Julian of Norwich. Norwich. During Christmas 1961, a long time after his conversion and many years after his entrance at the Trappists, 
Merton gets the more effective and effective acquaintance and relationship to Julian of Norwich, a 14th century English recluse. This woman, who is a great mystic, was already known by Merton, but it's time, this time it was different. He discovered her as a theologian, and he says, and he writes, and I quote, I have been moving around her for a long time, and I have been knocking on her door, and I've been hanging around her door, and I've known that she was one of my best friends, and precisely because I was sure of her friendship, I did not hesitate to seek what I have now found. Lady Julian's theology is a theology of the all-encompassing wholeness and of the fullness of divine love. That is the reality in the light of which all created beings and all the vicissitudes of life and history are diluted without importance. It is not that the world and time, the cosmos and history are unreal, but their reality is only a revelation of love. However, the revelation itself is not immediately clear. It takes the gift from God before the light breaks through and the full meaning of the world is seen in its true relation to God and his eternal and loving designs." End of quote. Merton is full of respect and admiration by this woman. And while studying and meditating her texts, deeply mystical and full of solid theology, discovers and states some points that the studies of mysticism today are recently discovering and systematizing. He says with enthusiasm and wonder about her theological method. I quote, Lady Julian is a true theologian with more clarity, depth and order than Santa Teresa. She elaborates theologically, truly the content of her revelations. First, she experimented. Then she thought, and the meditative deepening of the experience drew her back into her life even more deeply until her whole cloistered life at Norwich was simply a matter of saturating herself completely in the light she had received all at once in the manifestations when she believed she was dying, end of quote. In Lady Julian, Merton discovers a hopeful and almost apocatastic theology in which the author speaks about God with expressions of love and joy, and while not denying the existence of hell, affirms the existence of a much greater reality, which was God's love. One distinctive element of Lady Julian's mystical theology was the vision of Jesus as mother, and that motherhood charms and seduces the orphan Merton, who lacked mother since he was six years old. He discovers a woman with very particular visions that lead him to speak of a very special motherhood. The words of Lady Julian, all will be well, all will be well, and all kinds of things will be well, are quoted by Merton, who adds, the, the mother suckles her children with her milk, but our precious mother Jesus can feed us with himself. And he does it very cautiously and tenderly with the Holy Sacrament, which is the sacrament, which is the nourishment of true life. This beautiful word, mother, is so sweet and kind in itself that truly it cannot be said of anyone or to anyone except of him and to him, that he is the true mother of life of all things. The kind and loving mother who knows and sees her child's needs protects it very tenderly as is required by the nature and condition of motherhood. And as she grows in stature and age, she acts differently, but her love does not change. And even as the child grows older, she allows him to be punished in order to subdue his faults and thus cause the child to flourish in virtues and grace. Our Lord accomplishes this work with all that is beautiful and good in those who carry it out. End of quote of Lady Julian. This motherhood, referring to the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, touches Merton at that lost point of his life, his own mother. The image of the mother implies tenderness, solicitous care, and continuous protection. The feminine mystical theology of Lady Julian reached Thomas Merton because, in addition to that special maternal touch and vision expressed in her work, 
she lives amazed and moved at every moment by God's love for the human being. I would dare to guess if it is not close to what Merton experienced three years before this rediscovering Lady Julian, he experienced in 1958 at a corner in Louisville, an experience with pra which practically reconfigured his, he configured his music, mystical experience. It is now supported and reinforced by this mystical woman, Lady Julian of Norwich. The third woman is Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Seven Sorry Mountain, Merton tells that during the first year after this baptism in the Catholic Church, he had not the adequate devotion to Mary, Our Lady, and he comments on the negative points of being so. I quote, one of the big defects on my spiritual life in that first year was a lack of devotion to the mother of God. I believe in the truth which the church teaches about Our Lady, and I said the Hail Mary when I prayed, but that is not enough. People do not realize the tremendous power of the Blessed Virgin. They do not know who she is, that it is through her, through her hands, all graces comes because God has willed that. She thus participates in his work for the salvation of men. To me, in those days, although I believed in her, Our Lady occupied in my life little more than the place of a beautiful myth. For in practice, I gave no, her no more than the kind of attention one gives to a symbol or a thing of poetry. She was the virgin who stood in the doors of the medieval cathedrals. She was the one I had seen in all the statues in the Musée de Cluny, and whose pictures, for that matter, had decorated the walls of my study at Oakham. But that is not the place that belongs to Mary in the lives of men. She's the mother of Christ still, his mother in, in our souls. She's the mother of the supernatural life in us. Sanctity comes to us through her intercession. God has willed that there be so and no in other way. But I did not have that sense of dependence of her power. I did not know what need I had of trust in her. I had to find out by experience. What could I do without the love of the mother of God? Without the clear and lofty spiritual objective, without spiritual direction, without daily communion, without a life of prayer, end of quote. After entering the monastery, nevertheless, Mary gets to be more present and felt as beloved mother and spiritual presence. The day he entered, the abbot told him to always have the names of Jesus and Mary in his lips. Afterwards, we can see in Merton's writings some descriptions of beautiful spiritual moments he had with the mother of God, enjoying her presence and learning from her. And I quote, and you take your rosary out of your pocket and get in your place in the long file and start swinging homeward along the road with your boots ringing on the asphalt and deep, deep peace in your heart. And on your lips, silently, repeatedly, the name of the Queen of Heaven, the Queen also of this valley. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And the name of her son, for whom all this was made in the first place, for whom all this was planned and intended, for whom the whole of creation was framed to be his kingdom. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, full of grace full of grace. The very thought over and over fills our own hearts with more grace. And who knows what grace overflows into the world from that valley, from those rosaries, in the evenings when the monks are swinging home from work." End of quote. Also, some Marian feasts touch him specially, like the visitation, about which he writes, the feast of the visitation, which is for me the feast of the beginning of all true poetry, beautiful this, the beginning of all true poetry, when the mother of God sang her Magnificat and announced the fulfillment of all prophecies and proclaimed the Christ in her and became the queen of prophets and of poets. The poetic personality of Thomas Merton found in Mary and her divine motherhood a source of spiritual inspiration. The eternal feminine symbolized by her enchanted his heart and consoled his soul, 
seen Mary, not only the mother of God, but the source of all poets and poetic inspiration, together with the, so the source of all prophecy. Uh, besides those spiritual women, there are some concrete female friends in the Lord for Merton. Uh, Merton had some good and close women who were his real friends, women that liked and loved him as he liked them, women with whom he could talk openly and share confidences and helped him a lot in his life. Again, I will mention only some of them because they are many. The first, Naomi Burton Stone, Merton's literary agent, close friend and confident. When young Merton was writing novels, Naomi tried to publish them without much success. And when she learned that he had decided to enter Gethsemane, she thought his writing career was over before he had begun. However, when Merton had the manuscript of the Mountain of the Seven Circles ready, he sent it to Naomi. She saw that it was something very different from the novels he had sent her. It was the first person story of a convert who is searching and will always search. And that is something that had an impact at that time and even now. Naomi gave the manuscript to Robert Giroux, who did not hesitate to, pu to publish it. It remained on the bestseller list for one year. Merton's friendship with Naomi reached that degree of confidentiality in which one's most intimate affairs can be dealt with. I quote, I received a very delicate letter from Naomi in reply to another letter of mine in which I acknowledged my own confusion and self-contradiction, full of understanding and feminine comfort, the warmth that cannot come from a male and is so essential. From the psychological point of view, my doubt is based on a gigantic and stupid split, stupid split present in my life. The rejection of the woman, which is a deficiency in my chastity and in the chastity of so many religions. But I am learning to accept that love, Naomi's, for, for example, even if it means admitting a certain loss. The second I mentioned is Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day caused Merton to fix his gaze on social reality, which perhaps because of the life he had led went largely unnoticed. He had a reverential respect for her and considered her the living image of the gospel. In the hidden ground of love, we can find many letters he wrote to this remarkable woman. In one of them, he advises her who was in doubts about he doing uh, the right thing, those beautiful words of encouragement and spiritual help. I quote, don't worry about whether or not in every point you are perfectly right according to everybody's books. You are right before God, as far as you can go, and you are fighting for a truth that is clear enough and important enough. What more can anybody do? End of quote. In the letters he exchanges wonderful spiritual reflections with her about everyday Christian life, like this little piece on perseverance, he says, perseverance is not hanging on, but letting go. That, of course, is terrible. But as you say so rightly, it is a question of his hanging on to us by the hair of the head that is from on top and beyond, where we cannot see or reach, end of quote. And the third, Catherine the Hugh Dougherty, also mentioned it yeah. here already today called the Baroness due to her aristocratic origins. As white Russian, she was therefore familiar with the hardships of exile. He spoke with her a couple of times, nothing intimate, and yet her words and actions marked him deeply. Catherine used to give some lectures and talks to publicize the House of Friendship, which she had opened in the heart of Harlem, where with a small group of volunteers, she dedicated herself to putting the social doctrine of the church into practice sharing the poverty and misery of those black Americans for whom no one cared. There were no rules or explicit support from the church at the beginning. They were lay people and some priests, aware of that reality and animated by their fate, willing to help those abandoned by society. The work of this woman at the head of the House of Friendship awakened in Merton a deep evangelical concern for the service of the poor, and he went frequently there as a committed volunteer. He wrote about her 
Catherine the Hook is a great person in every way. Greatness is not merely physical. It comes from the Holy Spirit constantly indwelling her, moving her in everything she does. As a mystical person who had mystical experiences, Merton experienced eros and erotism very present in those experiences. And some of them were connected to the feminine, a non-human feminine sometimes. His closeness to nature and every living being of creation, even non-humans, show how open was his sensitivity to the point of identify some of those cosmic and natural elements with the feminine. He understood himself as the bridegroom of the forest. Reading his writings converge in demonstrating an intimate and progressive spousal-like relationship with creation as the body of divinity, at the same time veiling and revealing the God he so longed to see as well as to be seen by him. It is when he describes his living in the middle of the forest as an imperative necessity and not an eccentric luxury, as some might think. It is worth quoting his own words where erotism is present. I quote, I live in the forest out of necessity. I get out of bed in the middle of the night because it is imperative that I listen to the silence of the night alone and with my face to the ground recite psalms alone. The silence of the forest is my bride and the sweet, dark warmth of the whole world is my love. And from the heart of this dark warmth emerges the secret that is heard only in the silence, but is the root of all secrets that are whispered by all lovers in their beds throughout the world." End of quote. Uh, Merton spent his entire monastic life listening to this secret that all states at the heart of creation. And he espoused the forest so that he could listen with total rapture and commitment just as a husband does with the wife to whom he has vowed himself in joy and sorrow, in sickness and in health, loving and respecting all the days of his life until death parts. Monasticism has always been distinguished by this direct skin-to-skin -skin contact with nature and creation. Be in the desert, be it the desert or the forests, we will find men and women of God having their mystical experiences and acquiring their infused wisdom coming directly from the divinity in close and loving contact with creation. Merton, it was not free. It is that when the abbot appointed him as the monastery forester, which involved restoring the woods that had been striped and pruned a decade earlier, his experience of solitude and passion for nature became radicalized. It was no longer perceived as a deprivation of intellectual purposes but an opportunity for a corporeal embodied carnal commitment to a whole wisdom community, the community of living beings in silent participation with the vitality of living things. He discovered in this ever greater communion with nature that planting, fertilizing and plowing were activities that augmented his other monastic commitments as nature's spouse. Or is it not the husband who caresses his beloved, prepares hands for fertilization, fertilizes her? What else does the gardener with the earth, with nature, if not this? Merton will discover during this experience that the true mentor and director of souls was nature itself. His marriage with the forest intensified in the 1960 when he went to live in the hermitage in Mount Olivet. There he found a larger community and an incomparable choir of living beings that awoke every morning under his feet, the streams, the fields, the trees, the frogs, the birds, the flowers. All this made his praise and his monastic vows were felt as the silence under his song, the song of all those living beings to which he listened and to which he responded with his psalms, with which he filled the countryside and nature. Now, what did Merton hear in his ecstasies amid nature? He heard, in his own words, the sweet singing of living things. And he joined this chorus, a solitary monk offering hymns and psalms. 
his subjectivity, unique, desired and loved by the creator from all eternity, opens itself to the cosmos with admiration and reverence, murmuring in the silence a praise that joins the hymn of the entire universe. Mershon was a relentless and patient, passionate seeker of God. He was someone very learned who had studied a lot, the rich monastery library, been an obvious master and so on. Yet he found in the multicolored and multifaceted feast of divine creation, a wisdom, a wisdom never seen or suspected, which awakened in his spiritual senses, a primordial familiarity with creature. Thomas Merton experienced the ecstasy with nature's body, which for him had the power of attraction of a feminine body. All that prepared him for the encounter with a real woman who was the love of his life. This epiphany was M, as she's called in his diaries in 1966, two years before his premature death. The young nurse M appears in Merton's life when he is sick and suffering at the infirmary, healing from a surgery. She begins by being his caretaker. Healing his body, she also awakens his body, his heart, and his desire. Only when the suffering Merton fell madly in love with a student nurse, a forbidden erotic affair condemned by the Catholic Church and by the order, would he discover whether his devotion to God was stronger than his dedication to the woman he called a miracle in my life? And it is remarkable that Thomas Merton should speak so openly of his love for a woman, for this real and young and beautiful woman. The introduction of Christine Bohen in the volume six of Merton's journal narrates the beginning of this experience. I quote Christine Bohen, Merton left the Hermitage to go to the hospital for back surgery on March 23. A week later, he met M, a student nurse assigned to care for him, and they fell in love. In the weeks and months that followed, as spring turned to summer, they exchanged letters, talked on the phone when Merton was able to call, and spent some time together at Gethsemane and in Louisville. Their visits were few hours alone, fewer still. But almost from the beginning, their love blossomed, and also Merton knew that the relationship could not endure. He was, after all, a monk. Journal entries Merton wrote between April and September 1966 reflect his amazement and gratitude, as well as his ambivalence and anxiety, that he should at, his, at this point in his life experience love in this way, with all this passion and mystery astonished and frightened him and, as one might expect, the experience also bewildered him. Recognizing in himself, I quote, the deep emotional need for feminine companionship and love, Merton was discovered, apparently for the first time, what it felt like not only to love, what it felt like not only to love, but to be loved by another. In the entry of May 9, 1966, he writes, I quote, I have never seen so much simple, spontaneous, total love. And I realize that the deepest capacity for human love in me have never, even, have never even been tapped, that I too can love with an awful completeness. Responding to her has opened the depths of my life in ways I can't begin to understand and analyze now. M occupies more and more place in Thomas Merton's heart and mind. He thinks of her during the whole day, dreams at her during the night. He calls her at the, the seller's office. He writes to her letters, poems. As always, to be in love develops and makes grow the potentialities and creative capacities of human beings. With the rich personality as Thomas Merton, the deep love experience has this force and impulse that makes him self-produced more and more love contents and expressions of his feelings. His notes, entries in his diaries, in his diary, are like this one. I quote, this morning, we were awake thinking of each other at 1.30. She likes this, yeah. and so do I. But after I went back to sleep, 
I woke again at 3.30 in a splendid and terrible crisis of love, end of quote. Merton's encounter with M occurred during the critical time when Merton had come to understand that, I quote, certain desires and certain pleasures are willed for us by God. We cannot live in the truth if we automatically suspect all desires and all pleasures. It is humility to accept our humanity, pride to reject it, end of quote. That produced in him certainly courage and daring to face his feelings and deal openly and honestly with them instead of retreating to horror and guilt. He lives this love as a source of life and fullness of life. His writings, his poems inside the discoverer of this love abound showing on one side the frail man, marveled and wounded by the force of a love for a woman, being vulnerable to love because of his human condition. Without losing conscience of his vows and his identity as a monk, Merton lives a painful but also liberating experience. Those few months when they saw each other exposed him to many human emotions, temptations, psychic wounds, yet it was within this chaos that he experienced the healing and renewing power of love's world. The beauty of that relationship is the integration it brings with Merton's monastic vocation. Even with the conscience of the human impossibility of living fully that love, Merton speaks of it always with full respect and in highly charged religious and theological terms. His poems, not being idealized sentimental verse, but very personal communications to his beloved, reveal the sacramental nature but by which Merton cherished M. In that sense, it is not an idealized love which pretends to ignore or to overcome the bodily dimension. The two lovers, Merton and M, experience concretely and materially their own bodies and give their love a sense of spiritual fullness, despite all the difficulties they must meet to talk to each other, to be one another, to feel the presence of the other's flesh. Due to this very human love, Merton gained the new understanding of mystical love. He came to discover that this experience of being wrapped in a static love could occur not only as a private spiritual experience shared by God and himself, but also in an intimate relationship with a real woman, with his beloved M. Through the pain of separation due to his condition as monk and his vocation, he continued to feel true and real. The poems give testimony of his deep feelings for that young woman who conquered so unexpectedly his heart and the whole of himself. I quote a poem. We are nearer than we know. Love has another place of its own. Nearer to you than hill or city. Nearer than your own mirror. You wake in another room and the bed where you slept is a nest in my heart, for M on a cold gray morning. Now, in a certain sense, he was whole, though totally alone, having renounced to this love, the loving relationship with M. Now he had attained the integration of the feminine, Sophia, wisdom into his personality that had come through the fire of a flesh and blood relationship. As himself writes, I quote, the love is a this love is a disconcerting, risky, hard to handle reality, but it is real. It does not fully interfere with or invalidate my solitude, gives it a strange new perspective. All right, end of quote. It was not love sought, it was love found. It was not misfortune, it was luck. It was not fate, it was grace. Merton himself will see how different this relationship is from others he had had and how now instead of feeling unclean, he felt purified. It is as if he had recovered, as if for the first time he felt fully human, really human. I conclude. Contributions of Merton's way of relating to women for society and for church. The relationship of Thomas Merton with the many women present in his life reveal as a man open to the otherness and difference of the feminine. After having a patriarchal and machista behavior during his youth, the entering Christian life had a good effect on him, reconciled with the feminine 
through the feminine symbols Christianity puts in value in such a rich way, Mary, St. Therese of Lisieux, Julian of Norwich, and others. Merton is a Catholic monk. monk. He enters monastic life with a wide, deep, and open desire of living in communion with God and the church. He embraces the vows consciously and struggles to be faithful to them. Nevertheless, if we look at him mostly through this perspective of being a religious, a monk, he presents an unusual openness, not only to the feminine, but to the concrete and real women. And this comes, we think, from his personality and bright intelligence that remains constantly attentive to new signs, new inspirations and revelations. We can feel by some of his reflections that he questions points of the church discipline, not understanding, for instance, the compulsory law of celibacy connected to priesthood. I quote, the notion that priests must be celibate forms part and parcel of a deep-rooted general attitude toward man, the flesh, and the world. It implies a suspicious fear of marriage and the flesh, and it suggests that the perfect Christian life is reserved for virgins, end of quote. Merton is strictly against the compulsory celibacy for priests. To undertake, he says, celibacy in the spirit of perfectionism is a blasphemous waste of time. That is why it makes so much sense for many priests today, it's after Vatican II, to prefer a serious married life to a futile perfectionism in celibacy, end of quote. Speaking in a prophetic voice, Merton saw that the issue of a married secular clergy was critical. Some people, he realized, would try to ignore it in the hope that it would go away by itself. But that is not possible. It will become, Merton said in 19, 1967, more and more urgent from day to day, and it involves the future of the church in the modern world is the question of the celibacy for priesthood. Merton, Merton's mystical experience has always integrated body and sense. When doing the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, for instance, his favorite way of prayer was the application of senses. Mostly with his relationship with M, problematic and conflictive as it was and could be, we can learn that not necessarily celibacy is a synonym of chastity. Merton was struggling with the desire to love that woman and with the need to be faithful to his vows. Can't we find chastity at the death of his, this struggle itself? In any case, in this experience of love, he loved M with, M with her body also. And it was not a negative experience of a, or a dangerous of, and seductive woman who was deviating him from the correct path. Also, the relationship of this man with the various faces of the feminine who inhabited his life had an admirative and valuable attitude towards women, respecting them in all their dimensions. The repentance about the girls who loved him and whose name he forgot was one symptom of that. Also the admiration he feels towards the intelligence of women such as Julian of Norwich, or even the effective way he considers Naomi Burton's way of helping and cherishing him. With M, Merton is put face to face with a female who had a body and that body filled him with desire and love making him dream and not to sleep and spend the days waiting for a phone call or a letter. Despite the final decision of separation, we don't feel in any taxi rides that he fears M as a danger and a threat in his life. And that is a very important issue because up to date, we can see that discrimination against women within the church has a lot to do with that fear and that, and that sense of threat and the sense of superiority coming from men. Theological reflection on women's body highlights that one of the biggest sources of discrimination against women within the church is linked to something more profound and much more serious than simply physical strength, intellectual formation, or ability to work. The church is still very patriarchal, and patriarchalism underlines the superiority of male, not only by intellectual or physical bias, but also by what we will call an ontological bias. In other words, women are oppressed and discriminated by their own physical constitution, something that is not exclusive to Christianity, but is also seen in many other religions. 
A major aspect of this bodily discrimination is found in the fact that there is a strong association at the theological level with the fact that woman is responsible for the entrance of sin in the world and subsequently the entrance of death as a consequence of sin. This issue, was, which was officially denounced by the same Pope, John Paul II, in his apostolic letter, Mulieris Dignitaten, remains largely alive at the basis of the situation of women in the church. This is why the mystical experiences of several women were many times viewed with mistrust and suspicion under the strict vigilance of men who were responsible for controlling them and even exercising them. Several rich mystical experiences of women who were genuinely graced by God with spiritual graces were ignored. As for women connection with the mystery within the church, it is difficult and rare to find and authenticate an attunement with the high mystical experiences, leaving them relegated to the area of lesser devotions. Cases like Santa Teresa of Avila are merely exceptions that confirm the rule. Throughout the history of the church, women were kept at a safe distance from the sacred and everything that surrounded it, such as the liturgy and objects and places associated with ritual and from direct mediation with God. All of this would require a pure body and the mistrust surrounding women has been enormous. Despite all the advances and progresses in relation to the participation of women at several levels of ecclesial life, the stigma of the fear-inspiring seductress, the source of sin against the chastity of men and the celibacy of the clergy remains. That is why Thomas Merton's experiences and relationship to the feminine and to women are not only beautiful, very beautiful and interesting spiritual writings, but a real service to church and society today. Thank you very much. Professor Binghamer, on behalf of everybody gathered here, I know our tech isn't working well. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I do. Uh, I hope you could hear our applause. And so though we don't have the ability to take questions, I know we'll be pondering your uh, wonderful keynote address and all the wisdom that you've shared with us. Uh, one more time, may I invite us to thank Professor Binghamer for her presentation. Thank you.